Next up we have Maud Casey. Maud is the author of the short story collection Drastic and two novels, The Shape of Things to Come, a New York Times Notable Book of the Year, and Genealogy, a New York Times Editor's Pick. And George Saunders, now this is a guy um, I, I know everybody here is crazy about. George Saunders said, chief among the many pleasures of genealogy is Casey's compassionate, joyful, lyrical voice. She guides us with kindness, gusto, and humor through a generation-spanning, redemptive story about that blessed, cursed, tragicomic animal, the American family. Ladies and gentlemen, America's Maud, Maud Casey. I think that cookie is turning me into a butterfly. So in 1886, a man named Albert Dada arrived at a Bordeaux asylum after years of walking anguish um, in a kind of semi-trance state throughout much of Europe. The doctor he encountered there created an, an original diagnosis for him, which was called Fugur. And um, if diagnoses are a variety of story, and I believe they are, the doctor transformed his pain into a narrative, and the doctor in turn was transformed by him. And what I'm going to read is an excerpt from the novel I've been working on about these, these two men. Um, and it's an excerpt I've turned into a, into a story um, called Dreaming Together, 1886. Not much is required, one chair, one lamp, and a peaceful effect. An amulet, a letter, a telegram. These were said to be the best devices, but the doctor doesn't want to use props. There will be no need for props. It will be like dreaming. He will start simply. With two fingers, he will make circles on the top of Albert's head. He will pause only to brush Albert's eyes closed. Your eyelids are warm, he will say. They are getting warmer. He has heard the rumors, doctors using hypnosis for their own amusement. This will not be that. This will not be, for example, putting a man in a trance and asking him to drink a glass of ink and telling him it was beer. This will not be inducing a man into sleep, a man whose beard has been carefully cultivated over many years and then giving him a pair of scissors in the midst of his dreaming and instructing him to cut it off. It will not be slipping a tube filled with brandy down the neck of a lady's dress and whispering into her ear, eau de vie, causing the lady to shout, I am drunk, and then to stagger and fall on the floor. And it surely will not be telling a man that when he wakes, he will be a little dog in a hospital full of big dogs, a big dog hospital, and then inviting his friends to watch as the man woke yapping. This will be something else entirely. Still, he is not entirely sure what it will be. Since it all began, the afternoon when he first came upon Albert crying in his bed on the men's ward, the doctor has not been sure of anything. Albert had just come from a long journey on foot and was exhausted, but that was not the cause of his tears. He wept because he could not prevent himself from departing again. When the urge overtook him, he walked, sometimes 70 kilometers in a day, without sleeping, without eating. Still, it is difficult to know the truth when someone professes oblivion. Albert has a memory like a photographic plate of which some parts are blurred. Shh, Albert, shh. You are sleeping. You are a good sleeper. The doctor's voice sounds foolish, unrecognizable as he rehearses. Someone else's foolish voice. Only words, and yet when he says you are disappearing, the smell of wildflowers through the window is the smell of disappearing, while outside the city shimmers with other lives. And now you are asleep, he will say, and will give the ethereal if a solid spine. And so you are better now. He will blow on Albert's eyelids to wake him. How could Albert know that what is about to happen will make him forget the familiar ache in his legs? that will make him willing to give up everything he yearned to someday find during all those lost years when he walked, somewhere on the road to Poitiers, Champigny, Provence, vitry le Français, discovering himself not knowing how he got there through Budweiss, Prague, Leipzig, and Berlin, for no reason at all through Bruges, Ostend, Ghent, Liège, Stuttgart, and Mulhouse. When he walked, he was 13 the first time he walked, selling umbrellas for the salesman and test, 17, spending those first nights newly orphaned in the rotten hollow of a tree, and then 18, 19, then 20, himself and himself and himself again. How could Albert know that when the lamp in the quiet room flickers, he will flicker too? You are sleeping, you are nothing. But he does not sleep, he is not nothing. Everything except the brightness of the doctor's voice falls away. 
His warm whisper is a spark in Albert's dark, forgotten heart, the lit fuse of a gas lamp illuminating blood and muscle. When his eyes flutter open, he feels as though he will disappear into the doctor's eyes, perhaps because the doctor says, you are disappearing, and then the room disappears too. Shh, Albert. The doctor's hand strokes the top of Albert's head. It smells of pomade, cigars, and sausage. Your eyelids are warm. Everything is warm. The doctor's breath on Albert's face, his swirling fingertips, this body he's carried with him over the years, or years and years, or years and oh, he has been so tired. Where did those lost years go? It doesn't matter. When his eyes flutter open again, the doctor's eyes say, I know everything you've forgotten. The doctor's eyes are like the sheep Albert saw up ahead when he once discovered himself walking at night, tufts of white in the pitch dark night. This way, this way. Your arms and legs are motionless. Where are his arms? He swims in a long ago feeling, not caring where his arms have gone. He is a boy playing hide and seek with his father and his friend Baptiste. Baptiste was always content to stand in the middle of the street, not hidden at all. Even as Albert pulled him into the shadows, he understood his friend's desire. Why hide when all you want to be is found? When he finally managed to drag Baptiste behind a barrel, Baptiste would announce, here we are, over here. When Albert's father looked over the side, eyes widened in feigned surprise, Albert saw himself in his father's eyes. How delighted his father was to find him. In the quiet room, Albert is a miracle. He is a beautiful boy. You are sinking. You will not worry about anything anymore. He is a beautiful boy found instead of lost. Shh, Albert, you are disappearing. But he does not disappear. He does not vanish. The swirl of the doctor's finger spirals through Albert's scalp into his ears. He swallows the swirl into his chest, his groin, his legs, into his beloved feet. There you are, Albert. There you are, it sings, singing its swirly song. Once on the road, he stopped, and a good woman, seeing his distress, invited him into her house. When he refused because to be rescued again was unbearable, she walked out to him where he stood and held a glass of sugar water to his lips. The doctor's whisper slakes Albert's thirst. Hear your lost life. Hear your ragged memory. The doctor is surprised by the softness of Albert's hair. When he was rehearsing, he imagined it would be bristly, but it is as soft as the thistle down of the dandelions his mother used to string a crown for him as a boy. Shh, Albert, shh, you are sleeping. You are a good sleeper. Only foolish words, and yet there, a subtle, drowsy movement, Albert's head sways slightly underneath his fingers. When the doctor was a boy, his village was the world. Now there is so much to know, so much that is unknowable, but that is about to change. Out there, it is the end of any other day for all those shimmering lives. Inside, the day is about to distinguish itself. The sadness vanishes from the corners of Albert's big hooded eyes. His lined forehead is smoothed. His large ears are no longer absurd, but somehow strangely elegant. Beneath the surface of that long face, there is a slight trembling. Very good, Albert, the doctor says. But then the trembling slips beneath his own skin, and he is afraid. It rushes through him, and it is, it is as if he is the lady, and someone has slipped a tube of brandy down his shirt, whispering softly, eau de vie. It is he who is drunk. Up until now, his whole life has felt as though it was an argument against itself, but in this room, there is no argument. You will stay in the asylum, he says. I will stay in the asylum, Albert says. You will not walk. I will not walk. A basin clatters somewhere down the hall. Give me that, a nurse says. The bells of St. Eloi ring, and then the asylum bell calling everyone to dinner. The doctor blows gently on Albert's eyelids to wake him. Ring, shadow ring. Does this ring a bell? the sharp, quick sound of love in Albert's ears. Albert, you are a good sleeper. Now it is time to wake up. I'm afraid I will walk far, very far, with no one to watch over me. Somewhere in the sky, the birds and the doctor's voice chirp together. If you walk far away, we will bring you back. Ah, thank you. I'm very glad to hear that. The doctor blows once more, breathing him back into the world. He opens his eyes. May we do that again, he asks. Tomorrow, the doctor says. We will do it again tomorrow.